Today we're going to uh, pick up where we left off yesterday and um, and start talking about uh, one of the main benefits of working with an EFT, which is uh, namely that it allows us to uh, resum large logarithms. Okay, so. Um, our goal today is first just going to be to remind you how we use the renormalization group evolution equations that we derived last time in order to resum logs and what that means. Um, and, um, and then we'll introduce a, a simple toy model with two scales, with a heavy particle and a light particle, a lot like the one we studied uh, uh, with the tree level matching example from two days ago. And then we will integrate out the heavy particle at loop level, and uh, you'll see the manifestation of what, what's called the hierarchy problem. Um, and then we'll talk, well, probably that'll be uh, everything we talk about today, because you know, we can spend some time talking about the implications of the hierarchy problem uh, and how we think about uh, what solutions look like and so on. Um, and then really, uh, tomorrow, we will do the, um, what I think is the most interesting example at loop level uh, that I'll present to you, um, where we really write down a toy model that has a log only as a function of uh, parameters in the theory, and then I'll, I'll show you how we separate scales inside that logarithm and, um, and use all the same, basically we're gonna do the same type of calculation, it's just, um, then it'll really manifest this idea of scale separation in a concrete way, um, in, uh, in a loop calculation, okay? Um, so uh, first I just wanna remind you of what, we're, what we've done here when we've introduced the renormalization group and the idea of running couplings is we've reorganized perturbation theory. So now we have an expansion in terms of n to the n l l which sums alpha log, and we have, um, let's see, this should be, so when n is zero, we get one log, so this should be n plus one, okay? And then we also have the n to the m lo expression, which goes like alpha to the m without the logarithms, right? So we are, when we just do fixed order perturbation theory, when we just compute the Feynman diagrams, if we didn't do any resummation, then we would encounter both types of uh, objects in the evaluation of our loop diagrams. But now we're absorbing these uh, logarithmic corrections into the, a redefinition of the coupling, into this idea of a running coupling. Um, and we need to do this in such a way that we're systematically separating the expansion now into the piece which comes from resummation, which is absorbed into the coupling, where we compute order by order in the loop expansion, we compute the corrections to the renormalization group equations, and that gives us this resummation. And, um, sorry, this is, this is not what I meant. And then uh, here we get um, alpha to the m. But, but this, of course, this is not, this isn't quite right. The, this here we get, um, the alpha log series at uh, leading log, we get the alpha squared log series at next to leading log, and so on. Okay, that's what I really meant. Um, right, so this is, uh, this is summing the infinite tower, right, of these type of corrections. Um, so it's a, it's a series in alpha log, and then the next order is a series that's higher order in the coupling, right, gives us the alpha, squared log, the subleading terms. Okay, and we'll, we'll see this at, at least the leading log calculation, the one loop calculation, we'll see explicitly in, in this example, okay? So um, yesterday I was quite careful about labeling uh, renormalized couplings versus bare couplings and the difference between the mu, the subtraction scale that just appears when we use DIMREG versus the um, MS bar scale where we absorb this Euler gamma and log four pi. Uh, I'm not gonna be careful about those distinctions anymore. You can ask me if you're confused, but um, when we're talking about running couplings, they're always gonna be the renormalized ones. And um, 
when you see mu appear, depending on what step we're in of the calculation, uh, it may be mu or mu tilde, okay? But basically, I mean, at the end of the day, just it, you'll get the right answer if you just throw away the Euler gamma and log four pi terms, okay? Um, so um, here's just a simple case where we can understand the physics. So let's take a uh, simple theory, just phi to the fourth theory, we'll use our EFT notation, so we'll call this a Wilson coefficient, C4, and we'll write uh, four powers of the field. And we imagine that this is defined at a high scale mu h. Here, I'm not going to associate this high scale with the mass of a physical particle, but in a moment, we'll introduce uh, a theory with two different dates in it where one is heavier than the other. And so, but for now, just imagine that there's some high scale where your theory is defined that's associated with this scale mu h, and that's where I set the couplings, okay? Um, and what we want is a prediction for phi phi scattering um, at a low scale mu L squared of order M squared, okay? Um, and we're gonna do everything scattering at threshold, okay? So again, just to keep the, just to keep the equations as simple as possible, we're not gonna keep the full momentum dependence, okay? So I'll always just evaluate um, everything at, uh, at the threshold, so E is equal to 2M. So uh, we've all done this calculation um, in a QFT course. So at tree level, of course, it's just the four-point coupling, right? So we get this contribution, and this is minus I C4 evaluated at mu high, okay? Um, at one loop, now we have three diagrams. So this S channel diagram um, plus T plus U, and this gives us three I over 32 pi squared, mu high to the two epsilon, C4 squared, one over epsilon plus log mu high squared over M squared plus two thirds. Okay, so just like yesterday, we're using DIMREG. We, um, so I skipped all the steps here, right? But we write out the loop integral in Minkowski space, then we combine denominators using Feynman parameters, we wick rotate, we evaluate the resulting integral using the standard DIMREG formula, and then we integrate over the Feynman parameters, okay? So there's a, you know, a page of work to do or something here. Uh, and um, really all the hard work is getting the three and, and this two thirds, right? Because this structure, we knew this was log divergence, so this combination was, was going to appear, okay? Notice there's no energy dependence here, again, because I'm evaluating everything at threshold, okay? Of course, if you kept the energy dependence, it would be uh, more complicated. Okay, so um, now I take the formulas from yesterday. Maybe let me write. Um, is it here? So I take um, my formula for the renormalization group equations. Um, in this theory, we only have this quartic coupling. Okay, so um, so I have. D C four D log mu squared is epsilon C four squared D Z four D C four minus epsilon C four. And I plug in or I use 
the result here to determine what this z needs to be, right, because this has the counter term in it, this is one plus the counter term. So I need to cancel um, the one over epsilon, right, because I'm working in minimal subtraction, so minimal subtraction says the counter term is set only by the divergent part, right? So all I need to do is cancel this one over epsilon term. So I have z4 is one plus three over 32 pi squared, c4 one over epsilon. When I plug this in here and take the limit epsilon goes to zero, I get dc4 d log mu squared is three over 32 pi squared c4 squared, okay? Um, Notice, um, so the minus signs are important because, as we'll see in a moment, there needs to be a cancellation. So um, just to remind you uh, of why this is a plus sign, we write z equals one plus delta, where delta is the counter term. We treat this as a vertex in our, well, maybe let me use a cross, right? This is a vertex in our Feynman diagram expansion, and just like the tree level result, this gives us a minus i delta, okay? So that's that minus sign, and the i's are all gonna work out. Again, if you're very careful, you're doing all of this uh, from scratch, then you need, to be, you need to be careful about all the i's and the signs, right? So you've, you need to include an i for every propagator, and so on, okay? So a, a, a check, to make sure that you're doing everything correctly is that, you know, this thing is imaginary, this is imaginary, right? And so you're gonna be able to cancel these um, using real numbers for the counter term, okay? Anyway, um, so there's all these little details to track, but at the end of the day, this is what you get, okay? So we can integrate this differential equation, it's straightforward, right? We just move the c to the one side, we move the log, the d log to the other side, and, um, and what we get is um, we get C4 at mu high, uh, sorry, at mu low, which is the thing we need, right? Because we wanna make a prediction at the low scale where we do the experiment. And that's equal to our boundary condition, C4 at mu high, which is the term in our Lagrangian, divided by one plus C4 mu high, three over 32 pi squared, log mu high squared over mu low squared. Okay. Um, okay. So, this is a nice example because we can just solve the RG in closed form simply, and you see the fact that we have this logarithmic structure in the denominator is exactly this idea of resumming the logs, right? You can tailor expand this, we'll do this in a moment, but you can tailor expand this, and this gives you coupling times log to, um, to arbitrarily high power, right, when you do this tailor expansion. So you should be impressed, again, you're probably familiar with this, but if, if, um, if this was never emphasized to you, right, this is really quite remarkable because this is an all loop result, right? This is the leading logarithm you get from an arbitrarily high loop diagram, and we got that just by computing one loop diagram, okay? So this is uh, giving us a lot for, for essentially very little. Okay. Um, so there's, uh, one little bit of physics that we can see here already, um, which is uh, now that we have the running coupling, we can identify that there's a so-called Landau pole. So let's say mu equals lambda when C4 of lambda goes to infinity, okay? And you can solve for this lambda, you get m e to the one over three over three, 32 pi squared, 
um, C4 at M. Okay, so this relates the coupling at the low scale save order, the mass of the particle, to some very high scale, okay? Um, and this is a sign that the theory breaks down, or perturbation theory at least, let's say perturbation theory breaks down, because our coupling is going to infinity. You know, sometimes this is defined by four pi, it, the difference is small, okay? Um, but anyway, the, the point is that our coupling is no longer perturbative, so we can't do perturbation theory anymore. This is a breakdown of the effective description, okay? This is, again, one of these moments where EFT is, is uh, being smarter than we are. It knows about its uh, region of validity, okay? And so the, the idea here is that there's some scale above which we cannot describe the physics in terms of these phi degrees of freedom, okay? Um, and this often goes by the name dimensional transmutation. Um, and uh, okay, so um, I don't know if you're Calvin and Hobbes fans, but that always reminds me of, of Calvin's uh, transmogrifier. But anyway, um, so um, it's the same idea, right? This uh, we're, we're getting a dimensionful quantity out of nothing in some sense. Okay, and this is, I had, there were some great, we had some great conversation yesterday about um, how to think about the scale associated with the bare couplings or even this idea that, um, that there's a, um, a hidden parameter in the definition of our theory, okay? So this is one way to see that indeed just defining the parameters is not enough information that there's one extra piece of information that you need to set in order to define your quantum field theory. It's not just the parameters in the Lagrangian, but there's some other scale, okay? So if you like, this being generated dynamically is a signal that um, secretly there's another, there's a reference scale involved in defining the couplings in the Lagrangian, okay? Now you can use the Landau pole as that scale and define everything with respect to that, that's a perfectly valid way of defining the theory. But nonetheless, you know, you should really think of the bare couplings as being defined at some scale, okay? And so that's why we get this um, sensitivity to the scale where we evaluate uh, our physical process when we go beyond tree level, okay? It's because the loops are you know, the loops are, are sensitive to all the scales in the problem at some level, right? They, they somehow know um, that there's this extra bit of information that you need to account for, okay? Um, good, so, um, and of course, the same phenomena leads to uh, confinement in QCD, right? It's just the sign flips here, so the scale uh, where the theory becomes non-perturbative happens at low scales instead of high scales, right? It's the same idea, okay? It's also dimensional transmutation. Um, so um, what is this bias, this resummation? Well, I want to show you concretely um, what we do. So we take the tree level result when we talk about um, so-called renormalization group improved perturbation theory. The procedure we use there is we calculate the running coupling and then we just plug that running coupling into our formulas, okay? Now, typically, when you, probably when you learn this in a course, you use the one-loop diagrams to determine the, one loop, the running coupling, and then you just plug the answer back into the tree-level result, okay? And you called that uh, renormalization group improvement. Um, and that's great, that's a better approximation, right? It's incorporating this sort of all-loop effects of these logs, um, but I want to show you actually what that's really buying us by plugging the renormalized coupling, the, the RG improved coupling into this one loop calculation, okay? So check this out. When we, um, we can write the amplitude, so um, RG improved, it's 
So our amplitude, our matrix element, looks like the following. It's C4 at mu lo times 1 minus 3 over 32 pi squared C4 at mu lo log mu lo squared over m squared plus 2 thirds. OK, so here I'm just taking this result, OK, those two terms. Remember, the Feynman diagrams calculate i times the amplitude, so I dropped an i everywhere. And then uh, I'm being explicit about the scale where I'm evaluating this, OK? So everywhere I have mu dependence, it's always mu low. And now I want to relate that. Oh, please. The, at the very top? Yeah, good. OK, so what we did was, um, I solved this, OK? So I rewrote this as integral dc4 over c4 squared equals 3, integral 3 over 32 pi squared d log mu squared, OK? And I integrate from uh, c4 at mu low to c4 at mu high. And here I go from mu low to mu high. And then, um, this just gives me up to factors of 2, 1 over c4. This gives me log, this prefactor times log mu squared evaluated at two boundaries. And then I just did a little bit of algebra. OK? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, so um, notice also, OK, uh, I skipped one step, but um, here, which is that I included the counter term, of course. Right? So I have my MS bar counter term, which I've written here, and that cancels the 1 over epsilon dependence here. Um, and so, uh, and then I took epsilon to 0, okay? When I wrote this amplitude. So this is the renormalized amplitude, evaluated at the low scale. But my parameters were handed to me at the high scale, okay? So I, what I have as an input are the parameters at the high scale. I want to relate those to uh, what I see at experiment at the low scale. So let's use this renormalization group improved coupling to evolve us from the low scale to the high scale and let's see what happens, okay? So I can relate this to minus C4 at mu high times 1 minus C4 at mu high, 3 over 32 pi squared log mu high squared over mu low squared um, times 1 minus 3 over 32 pi squared c4 at mu high times log mu low squared over m squared plus higher order terms. Okay? So All I did was I Taylor expanded that formula, okay? So the leading term in the Taylor expansion is going to give me a minus, you know, one minus the stuff in the denominator, right? So that's this. And I also expanded in powers of C4. So notice I'm only keeping up to order C4 squared in the expansion, okay? So I can run, in particular, I can, this contribution, I can run from mu low to mu high. Uh, without actually introducing any other terms, because those terms are higher order in the C expansion, okay? Now, in, in practice, of course, you use the full formula, because the full formula is giving you more than this, but I want to show you um, why we do this, okay? So, th so that's why I'm doing this Taylor expansion. Um, and what we get is here. So this gives us minus C4 at mu high times 1 minus C4 at mu high log mu high squared over m squared 
plus two thirds plus dot 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 higher order stuff. Okay? So we reproduced the non improved result. Okay? Notice what happened. So we're going to see this happen a couple of times now. Is that my renormalization group evolution equations give me a log between two scales, mu high and mu low, okay? And the same log appeared in the fixed order calculation, the same low scale log appeared in the fixed order calculation, so that these two logs could combine to give me log mu high squared over m squared, okay? So when I take the improved result and I Taylor expand it, I get back the unimproved result, okay? But all the action is happening in these dot, dot, dot terms because here, this logarithm could become large, right? If my theory is defined at the Planck scale and I'm doing experiments at the LHC, then in principle this logarithm could spoil perturbation theory, could become bigger than the coupling expansion, right? And so my expansion's no longer convergent. But the whole point of using the improved coupling is that it sums all these effects, okay? And in fact, it cancels the leading log you get from the fixed order expansion and leaves you with all this subleading stuff resummed into the couplings. Okay, so that's the point, is that order by order, you can remove the large logarithms that are appearing in your loop expansion by absorbing them into this redefinition of the coupling. There is a cancellation between this log and this log, okay? So in, in this, notice in this way of writing it, this is a better way to say it maybe, right? In this way of writing it, what have I done? I now have a logarithm which is small, maybe it's even zero, okay? In this simple single scale problem, what would I do? I would evaluate mu low squared at m squared, right? So I kill this log completely. And then I just evaluate this coupling at mu low squared, and there's no problems with the convergence of perturbation theory. Whereas, if I didn't include all of this resummation stuff, if I just worked to leading order, now I'm in a situation where my prediction has potentially a large logarithm that could be disastrous for perturbation theory, okay? So these are equal to each other when I sum the dot, dot, dots, right? This and this. But at leading order in the expansion, they're the same, okay? So that's the point, is that for free, I mean, this is, this is a remarkable thing, okay? Is that for free, I didn't have to do anything other than run this clever prescription, right? It's the same calculation, and then I just have to sort of interpret it and solve this differential equation. Um, I get this, this incredible result where I have basically just a polynomial expansion of my coupling with my logarithms either small or even zero, okay? So that's really the point of renormalization group improvement. Now, that's true in QED where, you know, you don't have to use the machinery of effective field theory and so on, um, but uh, as I'm gonna now show you in some examples, okay, this is exactly the same trick that really makes effective field theory shine as, uh, as a computational framework. Does that make sense? Because we'll see this again. We're going to see this happen. Please, yeah, yeah, please. Let's. Yes. Oh, um, okay. First of all, sorry, my, my brackets are not, maybe this will help. So what I did is, um, so this thing in brackets here is just the same as this, okay? This combination 
is coming from taking this expression up there and Taylor expanding that. That's all I did. And then in going from here to here, notice that I dropped. In principle, I would have had a one, two, three powers of C4 term. So I, my dot, dot, dots here are including that too, okay? Uh, oh, oh, yeah, I just, I just didn't write it correctly. Yeah, 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 thank you. There should have been a plus two thirds here. And that's, of course, that's this plus two thirds. Yeah, thank you. Times this whole thing. I think that's why I got my parentheses wrong, because on the other blackboard. Oh, definitely, definitely. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> yep. Perfect, okay. <laughs> It's good because I, I, yeah, I don't want to confuse you with typos. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. The, by the way, and this also highlights another point, right, which is that the, um, the logs we get from the renormalization group have no constant factors in them, right? All these constant factors are coming from, well, I erased it, but solving that one loop diagram, right, and keeping all of the stuff that comes out when we do, uh, when we actually do the, the full dim rag calculation. And again, depending on, uh, how, how detailed your class was or how much experience you have with loops, you may have never computed one of these two-thirds, okay? It's there in the expression. It's trivial to keep track of it, okay? But I really, again, it's, it's comical that I didn't write it because I really wanted to include these terms precisely for, to make the point that you get all of this stuff that's not log enhanced comes along for the ride, okay? Because we're gonna see the, influence of effective filter on these ty types of terms in our, in our next examples, okay. Good. Making sense? Okay. All right, so now let's do a, um, an example with two scales, okay. Um, so maybe I'll start here. So the history of uh, heavy particle decoupling is, is actually kind of interesting. Um, when, I, when I wrote this, these Tassi lectures up, I, I did a little bit of a deep dive on just, I think I cited a lot of the original literature. There was, it was a big research question at the time uh, to try to understand how what I'm gonna show you works. It's gonna feel like totally obvious, I think, to you, in part because of course we're all trained by this idea that heavy particles decouple, but also um, once you understand this in the language of EFT, uh, it just works. But if you didn't have the language of EFT um, and you were using DIMRAG, you could really worry um, about whether or not this happens, okay? So you'll see um, that it's, uh, I mean, in my opinion, DIMRAG doesn't really work without the EFT interpretation, okay? Because of the, exactly the, the issues that are gonna come up. If you don't use EFT matching, then you're really missing important contributions uh, when you look at uh, integrating out a heavy state, okay? So again, we're gonna do phi phi goes to phi phi at threshold. Okay, I'm holding myself to what I, what I said in the beginning of these lectures, which is when we're gonna talk about EFT, we've gotta pick a process, okay? So we're doing this at low energies, and my full theory takes the following form. So I'm gonna use a notation with a little phi and a big phi. Um, so I have a, a coupling, phi squared, big phi squared, and I have a self-interaction for little phi. What's the symbol, this symbol? Uh, kappa. Yeah, that's my kappa. <laughs> and that's my eta. Um, 
just, yeah, because um, I'm going to do, uh, I want to use lambda for power counting, um, although maybe not in this example yet. But um, so this is what we usually call lambda, right? Good. Um, let me say, uh, so we're going to have um, m little phi equals m, m big phi equals capital M, and we want to take little m much, much less than big M. Okay, so they're both real scalars. Okay, so big phi is the heavy scalar, little phi is the light scalar. Okay. And I'll always give it like, uh, feet like this so, to distinguish them. And we're gonna just use this shorthand so I don't have to write these subscripts all the time, okay? So we'll have little m and big M, just like we've been saying over and over, and we'll take uh, our power counting will be little m over big M. Yes, yes, this is a coupling, this is a coupling, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I pulled these examples from two sets of notes where I use slightly different notation and um, uh, I apologize for not homogenizing everything, but um, anyway. Okay, so um, yeah, is this, uh, th this is great. Is the setup clear now? It's good, okay. Notice also, um, I just want to emphasize, in the full theory here, I'm actually not really following the principles of EFT uh, precisely in the sense that there are a lot of other couplings I could write. Self-interactions of big phi. I didn't impose any symmetries or I didn't say what I'm doing here, so I could have linear little phi, big phi cubed, I could have all these other types of terms, okay? But again, like I told you before, my philosophy here is that the full theory, I'm gonna take something non-generic to make a point, okay? But of course, we're gonna follow the rules when we do matching, and we're gonna generate all the terms at a given order that will appear, okay? But don't let that confuse you. Of course, there are many other terms I could write in this Lagrangian. Um, I'm just, this is the one I need to make, to make the point I wanna make, okay? So I'm gonna use this theory to show you two things. First, I just wanna show you how heavy particle decoupling works when we use DIMRAG. And the confusing aspect of DIMRAG is that it's a dimensionless regulator, okay? If you use a cutoff regulator, or if you use polyvalars, or one of these other regulators that introduces a mass parameter, then you would find heavy particle decoupling trivially, okay? The integrals would be a little bit more complicated, but no big deal, you just integrate, you get some result, and then you would take the limit that big M goes to infinity, and you would see the contribution for the loop involving big M would go to zero. In DIMREG, that's not gonna be the case, okay? So, um, so let me show you what happens, okay? Um, so here's our model, and now we can do a one-loop calculation. So a part of why I chose these couplings is because there's, uh, tree level is trivial, okay? Um, so, in particular, the big phi particle doesn't couple, doesn't contribute to the tree level amplitude of little phi, little phi goes to little phi, little phi, okay? Um, so I only get the coordinate coupling, I won't write it, we, we just used it in the last example. So let's look at one loop, okay? And now, I have three of these, right, ST and U channel, and I have three of these where I'm gonna use, um, let me write it here, okay, I'm gonna use little phi that gets dashed, big phi gets solid, okay? And Sorry, I have a typo here. Okay, so um, then my amplitude in the full theory looks as follows. I have just the eta, the quartic coupling, plus three over 32 pi squared, eta squared times log mu squared over m squared plus two thirds. Okay, that's exactly the same thing we had in the last example, right, as it should be. And um, now I get a new contribution, three over 32 pi squared 
kappa squared log mu squared over capital M squared plus two thirds. Okay? So in the last example, I could just take this mu to be low scale, no problem, right? Once I RG improve especially, everything's great. Here, I, I have a, a, a much more serious issue, okay? Notice that I need to use the same subtraction scale everywhere in the calculation, and so because of that, I can't take, there's no value of mu that minimizes all the logs, right? In this example, um, here, right, in this way of writing it, I take mu to be of order m, no logs. Everything's good, right? It's all in terms of resum couplings. But here, even when I resum the couplings, and I'll, um, uh, maybe I can write the RGs, I'll write the RGs in a moment, but, but you can already see, right, when I resum the couplings, I'm gonna have to pick mu to be either mu, mu of order little m or mu of order big M, but I'm in the limit that those are widely separated. And so I'm always gonna have a large log in the problem, okay? So that's the, that's the puzzle here that we need to solve is that, um, is that now it looks like I have no way of restoring the convergence of perturbation theory, okay? And the thing is is that the RGEs don't help us because let me write them. When we use DIMREG to derive the RGEs, they, they don't solve the problem. So, so I'm not gonna derive these for you. It's the same uh, technique we used previously, um, but in this theory you have d eta d log mu squared is three over 32 pi squared, eta squared minus kappa squared, and um, d kappa d log mu squared is one over eight pi squared, kappa squared plus one over 32 pi squared kappa eta. Um, notice um, when drawing when computing the evolution of kappa, okay, just to give you a little bit of insight there, there's two types of diagrams we could draw, okay? So kappa has two little phi's and two big phi's, like this. So we can either have, um, ah, this type of diagram, okay? So that's the one that goes like kappa squared, but we can also have one that goes like kappa eta, where um, we draw, let's see, um, big phi, I don't have these in my notes, let me think for a second. Um, right, something like this, okay? So here, we have a log with two mass scales in it. Here we have a log just with the light mass scale but it's the divergences, the log divergences from these two diagrams that give these two terms, okay. Um, so the point I wanna make here is when I compute the RGE, well, when I compute the running coupling from these RGEs, there's no capital M or little m, right? There's nothing that's gonna cancel off the dependence on these physical scales, little m and big M, and so using the resum couplings isn't gonna solve this problem, right? I'm still gonna be left with a log little m and a log big M, and one mu can't solve the problem for me, right? I'm always gonna be in a situation where I have a large logarithm, okay? So the point here is that when we have a full theory, where we have a wide separation of scales, if we wanna use dimensional regularization, then we actually encounter an issue at loop level, okay? So of course the resolution is we should use EFT, and in particular, anytime you have a wide separation of scales, 
You should integrate out the heavy physics. Okay? So let's do that and let's see how that solves this problem. Uh, do you have a question? Or? Good. Um, so here, the diagrams, um, it's these two diagrams give me this RGE for the eta coupling, which is little phi to the fourth. I want to compute the RGE for kappa. That's the one with two little phi's, two big phi's. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, and I, I mean, the concrete forms are useful to have, but but again, the point is really that um, they they are independent of mass, right? Um, and that's because when we compute in this, uh, when we use DIMREG, right, we're only subtracting one over epsilons. That determines everything, and there's no mass parameters that appear there, um, and so there's no way the mass dependence could feed into the RGEs. Okay, this is a property of dimensionless regulators. Um, so um, hopefully the puzzle is clear. Now let's see how we resolve it by using EFT. Okay. So we must match. So we need the infrared, the, e, in the EFT description, to have all the dynamics of the infrared of the full theory. Well, in this case, we, it's a simple setup, right? So we just have, we just need to write a theory with light real scalar fields, little phi, with mass little m, and we can account for the influence of capital M by absorbing its influence into, counter into uh, the couplings in our effective Lagrangian systematically, and now I'm gonna show you how to do that at one loop, okay, and, and what that buys us. So, because we're gonna be using renormalization group evolution and so on, now we need to be a little bit more uh, careful with the way we define our EFT. So, let me, here's the setup. So, in EFT, we often draw these kinds of diagrams. So, we have um, the scale mu hi, this is the scale where my couplings are defined, okay, just like in my last example. Then we have a scale I'm gonna call mu m for match, okay, so this is high scale. This is the so-called matching scale. And then I have mu low, which is the low scale, where I do my experiment. And these scales are arbitrary. I get to choose them for my convenience in order to make the perturbation theory converge as well as possible. So here, it's gonna be some arbitrary scale where the couplings are defined, okay? So I don't need to be specific about that. But here, the point of this mu sub m, this matching scale, is I wanna use it to minimize logarithms that depend on capital M. So because of that, I'm gonna take this to be of order capital M squared, okay? At some level, as you're gonna see, what EFT is gonna buy us is it's gonna allow us to introduce multiple scales to go inside these logarithms systematically so that we can then use mu match to set this log to zero and mu low to set this log to zero, okay? That's where we're headed. And then this low scale where I do the experiment is of course of order little m squared, okay? So if you like, this is the new ingredient going from the last example to this example, okay? So because I'm doing uh, two to two scattering at this order, um, all I need in the EFT is a four point vertex. So um, use this board.
and now I'm going to use my Wilson coefficient notation, okay? So again, I'm, I'm trying to use the notation here. The full theory, the parameters get these fancy letters, but in the EFT, now they're just Wilson coefficients. Because in principle, there's an infinite tower of these things, right? C6, C8, and so on. And um, to compute the amplitude at the matching scale, what I do is I equate now the amplitude, um, right, this is a superscript. The amplitude in the full theory minus the counterterm amplitude in the full theory, and I subtract the amplitude I compute in the EFT Okay, so, okay, maybe it's less confusing to call this plus. The point is, right, here I'm just talking about the loop diagrams, here I'm talking about the counter term contribution. Um, but you renormalize, the idea I'm trying to convey is you renormalize the full theory, you renormalize the EFT and you take their difference, okay? And that's what we call the matching amplitude. So let's compute it, or let's at least, I'll draw the diagrams and then I'll, I'll quote the answer. So I times A match is gonna be some effective vertex at the matching scale. And we get that by computing these diagrams in the full theory minus these diagrams in the EFT. And of course there's three of these, right, for the channels. Okay? So, tree level is, is trivial because I just have the same tree level diagrams on the two sides. So this tells me that to leading order C4 at mu match, equals eta at mu match. Okay, but it gets more interesting at one loop where now I have C4 at mu match equals eta at mu match. So this is tree plus one loop. and then minus three over 32 pi squared, kappa squared at mu match, times log mu match squared over capital M squared, plus, what was it, two thirds? Okay. And then here, right, I use the full theory RGEs, and here I use the EFT RGEs. So what I do is I interpret this combination as the boundary condition for the RGEs that I evolved to the low scale, okay? So notice what happened here is that I absorbed the log correction from that loop there into the definition of my boundary condition of my, my matching coupling. And now I have a scale mu match that I can take to set this log to zero. And I have no problems with perturbation theory anymore. 
okay, because there's no large volumes. Um, so let me show you that explicitly. Um, let me just emphasize in the full theory RGs up there, the influence of the heavy particle is there because that kappa coupling is uh, involved in the RGs, right? So that kappa is coming from a loop involving the heavy state. But now when I compute the RGs in the EFT, that's what we just did in the last example, just for phi to the fourth theory. So this has the following form, dc4 d log mu squared is three over 32 pi squared, c4 squared, no contribution from uh, big phi, say it that way. Sorry? No, no, even at loop level, right? Because in the EFT, there's only little phi now. So in the EFT, it's exactly the calculation we did in the, in the previous example, okay? Because we've integrated out big phi. It's not a propagating mode anymore, okay? So at this, this is the scale where we do the calculation very much in the spirit of what we did uh, when we integrated out a particle at tree level. Here, um, don't let it confuse you because, I guess I erased the full theory, but I chose the full theory parameter so that there was no tree level contribution to the matching from the heavy particle, just again, to keep it as simple as possible. Generically, there would be. So generically, when I did this matching, I would see contributions like one over capital M squared, like we saw in the example from a few days ago, okay? Here, it's just because I took the very specific phi, little phi squared, big phi squared coupling. There's no diagram you can draw at tree level, right? Because you need two to two, and so the only thing you can get in this example is a loop, right? If I had that cubic coupling, I don't have, for example, this, like I had in the example from two days ago, this would give me a contribution at tree level when I integrate this out, okay? Does that make sense? By the way, it's the same philosophy at loop level, okay? So what I've done here, it's just, now I'm showing you systematically how to do it using Feynman diagrams. What I've done here is exactly the same thing. I've shrunk this loop contribution to a point, okay? And that's what this is modeling. It's modeling the effect of this loop on the effective vertex in the EFT, okay? It's just now it has some mu dependence, okay? Because it's more complicated because it's loop level. But that's really the only new ingredient, okay? But by including the loop contributions at the matching scale, by doing this matching calculation, now in the full theory, I have both propagating states impacting my RGEs. I hit the matching scale, I integrate out the heavy particle, and then I just evolve the couplings using the EFT RGEs, and there's no influence of the heavy particle anymore in the loop. So that's the trick, and this is how we separate scales in, um, when we use DIMREG. Notice that, for example, there's this two-thirds thing times kappa squared, but I don't have to take the matching scale to be exactly the scale capital M. All I need is the matching scale to be of order capital M so that this log is small. In, in particular, the only rule is that this log can't be so big that perturbation theory breaks down. We want this to be a small correction on top of this, okay? But that's great. That means that when I cross this threshold, okay, I'm accounting for the fact that my RGEs are changing discontinuously. Because think about what you're really gonna do. You're gonna set the couplings at some high scale. You run them down to this matching scale. And now you discontinuously change the differential equation that governs their running. So you get a kink in the, in the, in the, in the resulting running coupling, right? Because it's running according to some differential equation. Now the differential equation changes and it's kinked, okay? What these corrections do is they smooth that out order by order, okay? So they give you these little corrections that soften that because that's really what you would expect. The running coupling 
the coupling is running, and now the degrees of freedom change, and you would expect it to turn, right? But you would expect it to have a continuous derivative. And so that's exactly what these matching corrections do for you, okay? So if you've um, ever been confused about, for example, uh, just putting step functions in your beta functions, right? Which is something, I don't know, comes up in model building quite a bit. You run some couplings. Um, and you say, oh, I crossed a threshold, so now I need to change the number of degrees of freedom, um, and so on. For example, like the, if you've ever looked at the running couplings in the minimal supersymmetric standard model, right, one of the important stories there is that the gauge couplings unify in the MSSM, they don't unify in the standard model, right? And if you look at that at one loop, you basically just put in a step function around the TEV for all the super partners, okay? What you should really do is this more complicated thing, right? You should include a matching correction in the boundary conditions, and that's what softens that step function, okay? Um, good, so our heavy particle decoupled, we no longer have any large logarithms, and just like in the last case, I wanna show you that if I Taylor expand everything out, I get back to uh, where I started from the full theory, Okay, so let me write one more formula. Um, put it up here. So I have, if I expand everything out, I a E, F, T, expand. Okay, so I'm just Taylor expanding just like I did in the previous example. So I get minus I, eta evaluated at mu H, um, plus three I over 32 pi squared, eta squared log mu H squared over mu M squared, plus C4 squared log mu m squared over m squared plus m squared plus 3i 32 pi squared kappa, well, kappa squared log mu h squared over m squared plus 2 times. Um, my brackets are not perfect here. What's that? Okay. So, I can get back to the situation with large logs by taking the EFT result, including the matching contribution and the leading log contribution from the RGE. Okay, so that's what this is representing. And indeed, you see that the eta squared contribution is going to cancel with the C4 squared, because this is, of course, eta squared at this order, okay? So these logs, the, the matching scale is going to drop out, and I automatically get the mu hi squared over m squared here, okay? So the, again, the, as it had to, when you work, when you go back to the fixed order expression, then all the logs reorganize to give you the problematic expression of fixed order. But the point I wanna make, and it's the same point from the last example, is that the RG improved an EFT matched example, which it's not, yeah, which is here-ish, okay, is, um, has no large log problems, right? Okay, and hopefully you see that this is, this, this is totally systematic, right? You just keep going order by order, and um, it gets more complicated, but it's the same idea, right? Just keep, just keep going, okay? Any questions about this? Yeah, please.
Yeah, I basically, yeah. No, 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 you don't set them to zero. You, um, you calculate in the full theory and you calculate in the effective theory and the difference is the matching contribution. So I interpret whatever, so I introduce a scale where I do the matching and at that scale, I calculate the difference. I'm basically computing right above that scale where I have the heavy particle and right below that scale where I don't. And I need to include the effect of crossing that threshold somehow and I do that by absorbing the heavy particle contribution into the couplings. Exactly, at the matching scale. That's right. And so um, the, and it's exactly what we did when we derived the EFT um, at tree level, okay, which is that we rewrite the couplings in the effective theory to absorb the heavy physics, right? The difference is now we have a heavy loop shrinking to a point instead of just heavy lines, okay? But nonetheless, locality is ensuring that this is a local operator at the matching scale, okay? And um, tomorrow, I think, def yeah, definitely tomorrow, we're gonna do a more complicated example which is even more interesting than this, okay? Where in this case it's sort of, it's kind of obvious that, that this should work, but in the example we'll do tomorrow, I'll engineer a model for you that looks like this. Um, so in the light particle theory, I have one heavy line and one light line, okay? And this kind of integral is where EFT really shines, okay? And, but again, we're gonna see that if you just do the dumbest thing, which is shrink the line to a point, you get the right answer, okay? Here, it shrinks to a point and you just get a contribution to a vertex. Here, it's gonna shrink to a point and you're gonna get a, um, a new type of diagram in the EFT. Okay, a loop diagram. That's right, that's right, exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But, it, but again, it's um, the, it's always locality, right? It's always, I absorb UV physics into couplings and IR physics that involves the propagation of light states, I leave alone, right? And I only compute the contribution from the IR physics once I get to the low scale, okay? where those are the, the propagating degrees of freedom, okay? So this is often called, um, so you do the matching calculation, you run the RGEs, and then you do a fixed order calculation at the low scale if you really wanna get everything, okay? Exactly, yeah, so when I, um, I erased it, but I have, I have two different sets of RGEs and I pick the scale where I, where I, where they, I go from one to the other, that's what I call mu match. And that is the same scale that needs to appear inside here, okay? So I introduce some artificial, this is, you know, just in the same sense of renormalization, this is a new artificial scale I introduce. It's arbitrary in principle. I just pick it to be of order capital M in order to minimize error, right? In order to minimize logarithms. So when you put that step function in, usually you put it in with capital M, but what you're actually doing is you're introducing this matching scale, okay? And then you set matching scale to capital M because that's the best choice typically. But if you really wanted to minimize the correction here, by the way, you could pick it to cancel this tooth, you know, you could pick it slightly different to cancel the finite term and whatever. But really the point is we don't care about the finite terms because they're never gonna spoil perturbation theory. It's only the logs that can potentially become large and spoil perturbation theory. So. Yes, please. That's right. Yeah. 
So um, the yeah. So I would say um, I think what I think. I think I understand your confusion, which is here I'm using the tree level. So I'm trying to do something iteratively. So, um, so first I matched at tree level. That was trivial to do. But, yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, here I'm using the matched, the tree level matched coupling. Here, well, I'm sorry. This is in the full theory. So I'm just using the full theory couplings. This, I'm using the tree level matching. So I've expressed the EFT in terms of the full theory couplings, but only at tree level. So there's a mismatch which is coming from the one loop contribution, that's what I'm calling the leftover piece. So if you like, if you prefer, let me, let me, uh, I think this is, this, you might like this better. I could write it like this. So I could say zero, and now, ow. Right, I have an effective vertex, so I'm just separating, right? What I'm trying to solve for is the correction to this effective vertex at loop level. That's right, but, but I, this is the thing I'm trying to isolate, okay? So, okay, maybe this didn't help. <laughs> but um, let me try again. So let me say, this is C4, as you say, okay? And then the, um, yeah, yeah, and then I'm solving for, and then I'm writing C4 equals C4 tree plus C4 one loop. This I already know equals eta, but this is unknown. And I'm using this procedure to solve for the one loop. Yeah, yeah. All I was doing was putting that one loop thing over here. And it, I, I, for whatever it's worth, that's what's often, that's how it's usually expressed in the literature. But, but it's absolutely, this is the philosophy, right? But the reason, I mean, there's a little bit of a reason to do that, which is just that because it's an iterative procedure, I'm just separating the thing we're solving for at higher order from the lower order thing, that's all. But yeah, if, if this makes more sense to you, this is, this is equivalent, this is exactly what we're doing. Yeah, please. It's all, this calculation is done at mu m, at the matching scale. No, so if you like, this is where the bare Lagrangian lives. We evolve to this scale, then we match here. So all these couplings have been evolved from mu h to mu m. Here we do this calculation. We evaluate all couplings at mu m, and then we evolve the EFT couplings using just the EFT RGEs to mu low. Exactly. This is the scale where we integrate out the heavy states and where the EFT emerges, okay? These examples where it's relativistic and when we're calling little, when, when I'm using the same symbol, by the way, in the full theory and the EFT, that's sloppy, okay? The phi that's appearing in the EFT is actually, you should think of it as a different degree of freedom. In particular, if I went to the high enough order that I'd see its wave function renormalization, the phi in this theory has a different wave function renormalization factor than this one. So they really quantitatively are different. We're just always sloppy about that distinction um, when we draw these types of diagrams in relativistic theories. But in other types of theories where the EFT looks quite different, the degrees of freedom are completely different, like HQET or SCT, then you actually do this matching onto different, very different looking degrees of freedom. 
the procedure is exactly the same, okay? You calculate with those degrees of freedom in the EFT, and you just equate All right. Um, okay, so let's get let's get started again. There was um There's, uh, there's, there's one more point that I, that I wanted to make here, one more conceptual thing I forgot to mention uh, before we move on. Um, so um, this idea that um, EFT is trading IR logs in the full theory for UV logs in the effective theory is manifest here also, okay? So I wanna, I wanna just highlight that a little bit because what we are essentially doing is in the full theory, we have these logs of little m, okay? But the, this full theory calculation, the renormalization scale is this thing we're calling mu high, right? So this is the scale associated in the UV theory. But we saw there are also logs with little m in them. I don't know if I still have formula. Yeah, like this formula, right? So here, Right, we have these kind of logs with little m in them, okay? So the, when we match, now the logs we're summing are explicitly these logs, okay? And so the, this, is, this is when people say, th say this, the idea being that we have, I presented it as um, you could have large logs if you, uh, depending on which value of mu you took, if you took mu high to be the high scale, you'd have a large log coming from the IR. If you took mu high to be the low scale, you'd have a large log coming from capital M, the log involving capital M. But really, I think it's better to, to think about it conceptually as mu high should be of order mu high, okay? So the large log here is really the one coming from the low scale modes, okay? The little phi loop. And, um, and so those are exactly the logs that the EFTRG resums, okay? But you don't resum them until you cross the matching threshold, okay? And so um, the, anyway, the, we'll see this again, okay, in the example tomorrow, um, but um, I just wanted to bring back up that terminology to start to, to get you to orient a little bit. And again, this all fundamentally comes back to the scale as integrals vanishing. Okay, and this one over epsilon UV versus one over epsilon IR, um, the fact that we equate those, okay? Because notice what we do, right, is because we're using DIMRAG, right, the fact that we have a discontinuous differential equation across this threshold, well, we're, when we compute in the EFT, we're throwing away the UV information. We're setting it to zero because it's now scaleless. Okay, we've expanded away the capital M scale it's not showing up in any of our loops anymore, and so it's not contributing because DIMREG sets all that stuff to zero, okay? So tomorrow, we'll, I'll, I'll also bring up this idea of the method of regions. Again, that'll make this even more concrete, okay? But I wanna, I wanna get you, that may not totally make sense yet, but, but give me until tomorrow, and when I show you the method of regions, you'll see that it, very literally, we can think of this as expanding away the heavy scale and setting all of its contributions to zero uh, using this property of scaleless integrals, okay? Um, okay, so um, the last thing I want to do today is I want to use the same toy model um, to show you the hierarchy problem and, um, and how it manifests in DIMREG, and, and I want to try to convince you that it's a, a generic feature of EFT matching, okay? Um, so I think I can start here. Um,
So you may often hear You know, people will say there's no quadratic divergences in DIMREG. Again, that's because the scaleless integrals vanish. And so um, the, but here I want to show you that even though we don't get explicit quadratic divergences, um, we still see the manifestation of the quadratic divergences through the matching prescription, okay? And yeah, well maybe I'll talk about uh, interpretation at the end. So let's just do the calculation and then um, we can uh, talk about the interpretation and probably we'll run out of time so we can pick it up in the discussion uh, later. Okay, so we have the same theory. Um, fine, I'm gonna emphasize the masses because that's where the hierarchy problem comes in. So I'm using the same notation with eta and kappa. Okay. And the E of T Lagrangian are the parts of it that I need for this. Ugh. Okay. Again, the same as, as in the last calculation. Um, so uh, Now let's do the matching calculation for the mass. Okay. So what I just erased was the matching calculation for the self-interaction of phi, but we can do the matching calculation for the mass. So I'll use this same, same notation, which I, I know has generated some controversy, but uh, we can, um, there was a request to, to work it out in a bit more detail um, in the discussion so we can make sure everybody's on the same page here. Doing this might help too, so. Okay, so we do this at a high scale mu high of order, um, sorry, do I mean a high scale? I mean a matching scale mu match of order capital M, okay? So in the um, full theory, I have this diagram uh, plus Sorry, I wrote this in kind of a funny way. Um, so I have these two diagrams, okay? Um, and plus the counter term. In the EFT, I have this diagram plus EFT counter term. So I can write um, and if you like the this matching contribution is just some vertex, okay? So I write minus I M match squared is minus I M squared um, plus I eta over 32 pi squared um, M squared log mu M squared over M squared. Um, plus one, 
uh, I did full first. So um, plus I kappa over 32 pi squared, capital M squared log mu M squared over capital M squared plus one. And then, so that's the full theory. And then minus the EFT part, um, notice I've already canceled the counter term, right? So I, I don't have any one over epsilons. And here I just get minus I M squared um, plus I C4 over 32 pi squared M squared log mu M squared over M squared plus one. Right, because I only have the EFT contribution. So tree level matching gave me, from the last example we know, tree matching gave me C4 equals eta. So at this order, I can compute this one loop contribution, what I'm calling the matching contribution here from taking C4 equals eta and just subtracting these. And clearly, right, this cancels this. This whole thing will cancel with this. And we're left with a matching correction, okay? So we find um, that Yes, please. Yeah, yeah, so this is ex Yeah, that's right, if you like, uh, exactly. Um, Yeah, so this is a, exactly, this is the tree level condition, and here I'm just trying to isolate the one loop, exactly. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, and so um, the, yeah, I don't think, I'll just write I kappa. So what we see is that if we only had the single scale theory, right, in DIMREG, the, we could take this mu scale to be of order little m, minimize this log, and there were, the correction to the mass would be small. But in the, because of this contribution we get in the full theory, right, from this full theory loop, there's this mismatch, the matching correction, that comes in um, when we cross the heavy threshold, okay, which is proportional to the heavy scale. And so this is, if you like, this is the quadratic divergence and if we take mu m to be of order capital M, which we're gonna do to minimize logs in the, in say scattering calculations, right? So we could set this log to be zero or small. We still get an order one contribution to the correction to the light mass, okay? So this is a more concrete version of what people do say in the standard model when they say, Oh, the Higgs interacts with the top, 
this loop is quadratically divergent, so I get yt squared over 16 pi squared capital lambda squared, and I say there's a problem, okay? Yeah? Yeah, good, very good question. So, um, so the RGE is not, it doesn't end up fixing this problem. Um, the, um, there are, so in, um, uh, in fact, what the RGE wants, so when you have, um, if, you, if you start at a high scale and you've got multi, um, if you've got a separation of scales at a high scale, what the RGEs gonna, are gonna tend to wanna do is bring everything to the same large scale. It's essentially due to these, these same logarithms, they're gonna be proportional to the heavy mass, and then if you evolve them long enough, they're gonna sort of make everything roughly of the same scale. And then, once you're in the low theory, because everything in the, in the EFT is proportional to the lighter mass scales, then again, you're not gonna get any big enhancements, everything's gonna kind of stabilize of order that scale. Um, the, um, the thing that, and so here, um, when I, so this is a tree level condition, okay? So you might, you might say, okay, fine, you get this huge correction, well, what do you do with it? Well, the point is that we can always pick the parameter in the EFT to be of order m full squared, um, say if this is, what sign does this have? This has a minus sign. So um, if we take m e of t to be roughly m full squared uh, minus m match or m1 loop matching, whatever you wanna call it, but this contribution we're computing here squared, okay? Now this is where the fine tuning problem comes, right? Because what we need to do is this, so this is tree, sorry. I could do, I can rewrite this if, if I'm, if I need to, I can dress this with uh, orders, because that's really the point. This is all gonna be of order capital M, right, because this contribution is of order capital M. So this is the one loop, this is the tree, okay? And so in order to get a, um, a small parameter here, okay, I'm gonna need to pick the parameter in the full theory to be of order the matching correction very precisely so that I'm left once I cross the threshold with something that's small, okay? So this is the weird, this is the bizarre thing. This is why we don't like this because it sounds insane that somehow nature would in the UV pick the fundamental parameter in the Lagrangian to be just right so that when you cross the matching scale, you get this very precise cancellation and you're left with something um, parametrically light at low energies, okay? So it's in principle something you can do because you have the free parameters available. So, and you know, there are examples in condensed matter systems where the mass you can think of as, you know, being essentially like a background field, like a magnetic field you can control. And then you can tune these things and you can find critical points, right? You can find all kinds of structure in, in say a phase diagram. But there you've got someone with their hand on a knob with a very precise instrument who can, who can do these kinds of tunings to find all these crazy behaviors. But at least in this naive EFT, right? There's no mechanism here. This is just some random accident and, um, and it's highly unsatisfying. Now, before I talk about solutions or, or the way we think about solving this problem, I wanna emphasize something which um, I think is important, okay? This is all a discussion of the parameters in a Lagrangian, okay? And notice I have not been careful to talk about schemes or any of these kinds of issues that come up when you're mapping from parameters in a Lagrangian to observables. So again, this is not an in principle problem in the sense that I can always do this kind of tuning. I can always say, in nature I found a light Higgs boson, and so 
the Lagrangian is what it needs to be to give me that light Higgs boson. Once I set those parameters, I just compute and I'm happy, okay? And there is a segment of our community who thinks that's true and, and this doesn't bother them. And you can decide if you're, uh, you know, how much this is gonna keep you up at night or not. Um, but the claim, which I would stand behind, I think um, anyone who's done any amount of model building will tell you from experience that these kinds of mass parameters always feed in. If you try to build a UV completion on top of the standard model, it's going to involve a new heavy mass scale, and you're going to get these kind of quadratic contributions to the mass of the Higgs. So the, you know, the question is, do you think of your quantum field theory as being defined in the UV, okay, say by a string completion where all the parameters are set at a UV scale, and then they evolve down and you get some low energy dynamics out? Or do you just think about the quantum field theory as a low scale tool that we use to compare to experiment and make further predictions? And if all you care about is the low scale, you're never gonna see this kind of problem, okay? It's not something you can compute in low energies. And I think, I hope that that's now clear just from seeing these examples of EFT because we really integrate out the heavy state once we've done that and we set those boundary conditions, the heavy state doesn't contribute anymore other than its influence on the local, the coefficients of local operators, okay? Um, nonetheless, uh, this is bizarre, right? Let me just say, right, if we want this to be of order little m and well, squared, whatever, right, then we need a massive cancellation in order to realize this, okay? Um, so, um, so the, if you found the tool of matching compelling in the previous example, right, as a, as a mechanism for solving, for solving a breakdown of perturbation theory, then I would claim that you have to buy that the same type of calculation forces upon you a fine tuning in uh, in the mass parameter without some extra mechanism at play, okay? Um, and I sound defensive because there's been a lot of wrong things said over the years about this problem. And, um, and again, it's not a problem, it's not technically a physical problem, okay? It's a, it's a model building problem. It's when you try to UV complete, then you will generically find this happens, okay? But it's not something you could go and measure. I've had a lot of conversations over the years with people. Nobody, I actually don't believe that it's possible um, because I under, because of this understanding of EFT, I genuinely th believe that this is a UV problem, that there's no way to see it in the IR, okay? Um, and so, now you, you can see the mechanism that solves the problem in the IR, that's a different statement, but you cannot see the, um, there's no observable you can compute that will show you this mismatch, okay? So, um, We've got five minutes and I just want to emphasize um, what the solutions look like, okay? So, um, oh, and by the way, and I, I uh, again, because I feel like I have to defend this, um, if you go look at my TASI lectures, there's a way too long multi-page discussion of, um, uh, of the problem and I break down some toy models to solve it and so on. But I really just want to give you a sense because you may not have thought about this much of, um, what EFT-based solutions look like, okay? So if we're gonna think about this from the EFT point of view, then the way to solve the problem is to introduce extra symmetry. The reason that the problem appears here is because in these simple toy models, there's no symmetry we can write that protects the mass of the scalar, okay? Um, and so the, um, the solutions to the problem are if I can, well, there's now there's a, a much wider class, I would say, of solutions, but the field theoretic solutions, the EFT-based solutions, are if I promote the mass parameter to a spurion of some symmetry breaking, then I have a reason for that parameter to be small, and that parameter will be protected from loop corrections. So the, this kind of contribution, proportional to an arbitrarily heavy scale, 
won't come in and, uh, and infect my low energy mass parameters, okay, if I have enhanced the symmetry properties in the IR such that uh, the mass parameter is a spurion. So we have, uh, yeah, yeah, please, please. Indeed, I agree. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, but this is, uh, so the, and that's an, another way of saying that is just, I think it's fair to say if there are no new scales in nature that couple with any, you know, with any reasonably sized coupling to the standard model, maybe there's no hierarchy problem, right? But, but of course we believe that uh, we need a mechanism for baryogenesis. We need, you know, there needs to be additional um, additional physics that's coupled to the standard model at some heavy scale, right? And so, um, but but absolutely, that's that's a way out. Is just that there are no are no other scales. By the way, there's a really interesting um, paper by uh, Martin Schmaltz and um, Vitek Skiba and uh, I think Gustavo Marcus Tavares was on that. Anyway. Um, but they, so this was again, this was now maybe even 10 years ago when there was a lot of complaining that maybe the hierarchy problem doesn't exist. So the, um, what they showed, I thought it was a very interesting paper. Um, they said, okay, maybe gravity is friendly. Maybe all that happens is the anomalous dimensions associated with the running of, of um, all the parameters in the standard model turn off through some unknown mechanism. They just have a sharp turn in them um, so that they basically get no UV contributions. Um, and what they showed in that paper on very general grounds is because that turnover has to happen at a scale that even though there's not a, they didn't input a scale into any of the loop calculations, but just the very presence of that kind of, um, uh, of deflection of the anomalous dimensions would come in and generate a, a contribution to the mass of the Higgs or of the scalar field at high scales of order the scale where that turnover happened, okay? So it, I, I just thought that was fantastic because it's another, um, it's a here, like, let's imagine that QFT is maximally friendly to us and yet you can still see that um, this is just a generic issue that you can't really avoid. Um, again, if you take the high scale seriously, right? So, um, okay, so, you probably know this, but um, there are two field theoretic, known field theoretic solutions to the problem. And there I want to distinguish um, the solutions that really solve the problem to all loop orders, okay, from solutions that work at say one, maybe two loops. Because there's a lot of literature now on, um, on building models, and I've written a, I have a number of papers myself, uh, where we've investigated models that have, um, that basically solve what we call the little hierarchy problem, basically postpone the problem by a loop factor, okay? Um, that's interesting because it can lead to novel signatures and there's all kinds of fun model building you can do, but, um, but those are not real solutions in the sense that they solve the problem to all orders, okay? So um, I wanna highlight the two field theoretic solutions. Okay, so the first we talked about a little bit the other day Okay, this is that, um, this is the idea that the Higgs um, secretly has a shift symmetry, okay? So a phi goes to phi plus a constant, which forbids the mass. But, um, and the most natural way that that could arise is if the Higgs is a composite particle and it's like an analog of the pion, a Goldstone boson of some strong coupling, um, and, um, you know, this has some generic features. There's some difficulties you have to, um, work around. So there's some hard model building to do. Namely, if you want to have Yukawa couplings, um, Yukawa couplings break this shift symmetry explicitly. And so, um, there's a whole framework called partial compositeness where you basically, um, try to get around that problem. It's hard to do with the top Yukawa because it's order one. 
nonetheless, there's um, there's a huge literature on this, and uh, there's the um, strongly interacting light Higgs paper. Um, so if you're not aware of this, usually called Silch, um, this is a great, really, really great paper, very EFT-based uh, point of view on um, the properties you would expect for composite Higgs. Um, highly recommend reading this. Uh, if you just search strongly interacting like Higgs, it's Jujice, Ritazzi, Pomerol, and uh, Grosjean, I think, um, from now 10, 15 maybe years ago. Okay, so that's one field theoretic solution. There's a huge literature here um, and, um, and lots of interesting stuff to talk about. Okay, I know I'm out of time. The other, of course, is supersymmetry. And if you're, this is you know certainly something if someone wants to bring it up during the discussion, we can talk about it more. Um, but with supersymmetry, um, here we need to introduce partners for every particle in the standard model. And in particular, um, the phi gets a partner psi, okay, a fermionic partner. And then the fact that um, m psi bar psi is a spurion for uh, chiral symmetry breaking, This fact uh, tells you that corrections to the mass of the fermion are always proportional to the fermion mass itself, right? This is a property in QED. Hopefully it's something you've seen before. Um, if not, again, we can, we can talk through this more in the discussion. But you can understand that as a, as a spurion analysis because this is a spurion for chiral symmetry breaking. And um, so because there's a symmetry that relates the scalars to the fermions and the fermion mass is protected by a symmetry, Okay, the fermion mass is a spurion, then the SUSY um, implies that M, so this is if this were M psi, M phi is also a spurion. Okay, and that's the starting point for SUSY model building. Now it turns out that you can introduce a, um, what's called a soft breaking, okay, which essentially is. Um, you can introduce extra mass for the scalar particles, which, um, and you can show that that doesn't cause you to have quadratic sensitivity to, to higher scales. It really, all corrections are proportional to that breaking. And so, um, so again, there's a whole framework here. Um, if you've never taken a look at Martin's supersymmetry primer, um, that should be required reading for phenomenologists and, um, Certainly when I was a graduate student, it was. Now people don't study supersymmetry so much, but um, it's absolutely beautiful. At least um, you should read the first, I don't know, 50 pages of that or something. Um, get a sense of the framework and, and the phenomenology. Um, and, uh, and so anyway, for the, I would say for composite Higgs, this is probably the place to go. And there's also review articles and, and so on. And I could point you to stuff. For here, I would, I would look at Martin's primer. Anyway. Um, Last, one last comment is just that now there are all kinds of um, much more radical solutions to the hierarchy problem. A lot of them invoke cosmology. Um, and so, uh, and, and that's been very interesting. Um, and, and again, something that a lot of us have been involved in. Um, probably a lot of you are, are thinking about that. Um, and so uh, anyway, it's, it's, you know, we need to figure this out. Hopefully data will tell us something, but um, for the purposes of our you know, lecture, since we're focused on EFT, I want you to walk away from here with um, understanding, I hope, what the problem is in a maybe a little bit more technically correct way, but also um, I really want you to see it as a problem of EFT, okay? So it is a consequence of matching and there's, there's just no getting around it. If you've got another heavy scale that couples to us, it's going to feed into the Higgs mass unless there's some protection mechanism. Okay, thanks. Um, and. We'll stop there.